Okay, so we are going to start up this session, and this session is going to going to shake things up a little bit. Um, I don't know. I've I've felt really positive about about all the amazing things that you all are doing. You know, there are these great seeds of of hope and love and openness in in, in many communities, and and the commonalities between them are powerful, uh, but also the differences, the shared learnings. Um, so th there's incredible momentum. We have this global movement. We're all connected, but what is the impact we're all having? How are we really addressing the larger challenges um, that we're facing today of equity, of health, of loneliness and connectedness, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, the sustainability and, and, and other crises and conflicts, my, uh, migration and, uh, and so forth. Um, so this group of people is gonna, is gonna come up and tell us what the biggest challenge is and then we're gonna have a conversation on how, what the, what the biggest challenges are that we're facing, uh, and then fig discuss how place, public spaces, how you all can help to start to, to scale up our impact, to uh, to build on. What, you know, we, we've we, we've found some you know some great momentum, great success, um, but uh, to 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 figure out how to how to actually address more fundamentally and connect with broader networks, start to use language that that connects with other people as well. Sometimes we we use some of these terms to connect with each other and develop this, this network, but we need to challenge all these ideas now as well. So I'm gonna introduce the, the whole panel, each one of them, um, and, uh, and you know, first wanna introduce Emily Silverman, who uh, is gonna be the moderator. Um, and she, we first met her, she brought us to Israel back in January 2001 and toured us around uh, having us give presentations and uh, and then brought us back again a couple years ago um, and we did these trainings and workshops all over Israel and then at, at the very end of the week she brought people from all these different communities very diverse in every kind of way um, uh, together for a, for a panel and I've never and she you know moderated it extraordinarily well so it, we knew she was the right person to, to to, uh, to deal with this this exciting rowdy group you're about to see, Ethan and I sat in the middle because it is yeah. a rowdy yeah, yeah, group, yeah. and she's, this so way she's going like to keep them all, all in, in check and and you know stay careful. It's good there's no one in the front row here. Um, <laughs> uh, so next, I'm going to introduce Cecilia uh, Anderson from from UN Habitat. She leads the U, the public space program at UN Habitat, and we've been really lucky to work with her for a while and. Um, and, uh, and she's going to sort of set the context of, of the larger global patterns of urbanization and how do we connect to that conversation. Um, and then Neil McEnroy, who's a long-term friend from Scotland, works in Manchester. Uh, we first met touring Australia and New Zealand, uh, doing trainings uh, many years ago. And then we've just bumped into each other again in Auckland. Okay. Oh, yeah, and he also keynoted the first uh, placemaking leadership council in uh, in, in Detroit, and he fell on the floor, and we're hoping he'll do that again. But it, it, was, it was intentional, but you'll see. You'll, intentional. It was intentional. <laughs> you'll see. Um, and, That's the way you wake up. Um, and then uh, and Lynn um, is going to come up, kind of, and she, she leads the, the, the Congress for New Urbanism, and um, uh, used to work at EPA under the Indian Obama administration, helping to lead um, the, the place-based work um, that, that nice the center. Environmental Protection Agency, Housing Urban Development, DOT, was leading, the sort of the, um, the collaboration between these very siloed agencies in the United States uh, as well. And then lastly, I get to introduce Gil Penulosa, one of our favorite people. We've gotten to work with him for over 20 years. He brought us to Bogota when he was Parks Commissioner uh, and, uh, and he, um, we've since gotten to work with him all over the world, but one of the most inspiring advocates uh, for public spaces um, globally, if you, haven't, if you haven't already heard of him, I'm sure you, most of you have. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay, and, Ethan, and, and you. And, and, yeah, eventually <laughs> I may join back in. Okay, <laughs> so we've spent the last two days intensively looking at what am I doing? right now, listen to what I'm doing. And, and let me tell you about what, what I'm gonna do next month and, and what I wanna do next year. And I wanna tell you about mine next month and next year. And it's super exciting to be part of that very inside world of what we're all doing together and what we share. 
And I think what we want to do now with a deep breath is move to what's in that outside world. What are the challenges? What are the trends, the trajectories that are going to be coming at us, whether it's in the next five years, the next 10, the next 25? So this incredible panel, what do we see when you look down the line? What are the challenges that placemaking as a movement is going to have to respond to and maybe is going to be able to respond to? Cecilia. And your slides are supposed to come up. We will. Do you think there's a clicker or something? Or? A... Great. Sorry, I'm actually a lot better when I'm moving around a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was asking about what I think are the biggest challenges that's coming at us in the next 10 to 20 years, um, I think it's rapid urbanization. There's about 1.5 million people per week that is uh, being added to the cities in, to our cities. And 1.5 million, that's uh, if uh, Amsterdam has 800,000 uh, people as a population, that's twice Amsterdam per week that's being ab added to uh, the cities. And I think this is a great challenge. How are we actually going to be able to work with that? And... Uh, we're seeing that one of, the, one of the issues is the low density sprawl. And I think that was shown very nicely today as well by this presentation in Lima, where you get the sprawl that is growing up on the, on the um, mountainside. And I think this is something that local governments are grappling with. How do you actually provide infrastructure to be able to support this population growth and the growth of the cities? And it looks the same everywhere in the US, in Mexico, in China, in Bolivia. And uh, if you actually look at those pictures, if I didn't have the titles there, I think you wouldn't really know where that was because it looks the same. And with that lack of infrastructure, we're also finding that uh, the streets and there's lots of congestion because there's not enough space for uh, there's the lack of infrastructure. And with that, not only lack of infrastructure, I think a lot of the cities are built for cars, but we're forgetting that the majority of the population in a lot of the cities, especially in the developing world, um, and where a lot of the population growth is going to take place, I think 90% of the global population growth moving to urban centers is going to be in Asia and Africa. And we need to actually take a really serious look at that. But with that also comes that um, the dependency on the, on the car and building cities for cars. And we need to think differently. We're also not looking at the social mix. And I love this picture because we're actually, we're building uh, towers in the park without actually thinking about the space where it's being built. And I think this is what uh, I think Gail talks a lot about. We need to think differently. We need to think about the space first, then how people use it, uh, or how people use that space before we start building. This is also creating huge inequalities. In many of the cities that we work with in the developing world, 60% of the population live in informal settlements. And there are great gaps between the people that have and the people that don't have. And I think this is something that is going to come at us in the next 10 to 20 years, and we need to deal with that. This is where I live. I don't live there, but I live in Nairobi. And this is one of the slum areas in Nairobi. It's called Kibera. There are about 250,000 people that live there. And um, there's not much public space. And there's not much uh, services that are being provided by the local government. And I think this is really important. How do we actually plan our cities? This is a picture from Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. So you have the formal planned area, and then you have the informal area that is growing up on the outskirts without any planning, without any services, and without much public space or space for people to use. And these are the people that need those spaces the most. So we need to move away from business as usual. We need to move from urban sprawl to more compact cities. We need to move from the segregated uh, neighborhoods to more integration, so the uh, social mix, multifunctional neighborhoods. We need to move from the congested city to more connected cities. This is just a few examples of one of the 
projects that we're working on in Korogocho, which is one of the poorest slum areas in the outskirts of Nairobi. It's the first place where a lot of the people that come to Nairobi end up. It's next to the dump site. So the majority of the people that live there actually work off the dump site. But with small measures, there's a, a wonderful way of actually building that sense of community. And uh, I just wanted to show a few positive pictures as well because I felt a little bit dark here actually showing you all these other pictures. And this is also sort of engaging people in building place, in building space, and how they can come together in the city and, uh, and build a lovely, a lively city for us to live in. Wow, thank you. You ready for next? Me. You ready? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. With that introduction and with slides, we are now done with slides, right? And yeah. we're just off, just, just people talking. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. Uh, I've just flew over today from uh, Ireland, so uh, I'm a very, very busy week and very tired, but I'm lovely to be here and I've had a great week, and I'm sorry I've not been here for the rest of the, the time. Um, I'm from the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, we're a UK organisation, work across Europe, and we're about progressive economics for people in place. So I'm an economist, uh, though I've went a bit weird in that I've got interested fundamentally in how we make places that work for people and places that are socially and economically just. And I see place as the commons. It should be accessible to all members of society. And placemaking should be a deeply radical and progressive movement. We need to make place democratic. However, one of the biggest challenges we have is from the economic model that stewards our world. The 10 richest men, and they are men, they have the same amount of wealth as 50% of the rest of the population of the world. The economy is not working for the many, it's working for a few men. And placemaking needs to get on to that agenda. Cecilia touched upon the inequality I believe that the economy is a defining feature of place. Economy steers who owns place, who can influence place, and what happens in it. And at the moment, the economy we have is a selfish economy. It's an extractive economy that takes value out of place and takes it somewhere else, often to the Cayman Islands or people who have got nothing to do with that actual locality. Placemaking and all of us have got a part of a movement and we've got a job to do and it's a hard job. We cannot dance to that economic tune anymore. We are gonna to have to be part of a movement that creates a new economy and makes the economy dance to a different tune. The economy controls the nature of place and there's four examples of this. Firstly, it privatizes space. It commercializes space. We need to democratize that space and place. The economy tends to create singular uses of places. We need to pluralize the use of places. The economy looks to, uh, it favors the financial value of place. We need to look to the social ecological and cultural value of place. The economy seeks to create globalized places. We need to localize places for well-being and for the use of citizens. There's a job to be done. So we've got a choice. We can, as part of this movement, we can fit in to the economic power which is further down in the hierarchy of things. Let's be no bones about it. Placemaking is low down the hierarchy here. The economy, in my view, controls the size. We can play within that and seek to influence it. I don't think that'll work moving forward. The crises are too much. We need to get belligerent, assertive, strident, and join forces with a whole range of other movements who are trying to create a better world for all, an economy that works for the many, not for the few. And finally, what we say in my organization is we need to localize, socialize, and democratize the economy. 
LSD. <laughs> I say we need to open new doors of perception about how we run the economy and how placemaking is a key facet of creating a new economy. Thank you very much. I'm not, I'm not sure how many here are old enough to have known the, the uh, reference to doors of perception, <laughs> but I was wondering what you meant by globalize the economy and social value, and now I know, LSD. So <laughs> hopefully when we move on, you'll give us concrete examples of what you, of what you mean by that. Lynn, over to you. Hi, everyone. So um, the Congress for the New Urbanism just celebrated its 25th year. And as the head of it, my board is, is asking me, well, so what's next for the next 25 years? So I've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, how, what are the big issues that will be facing community design and development in the next 25 years? And then backing up from that, what can a CNU do now to help either leverage those trends or to, or to help mitigate uh, some, of the, some of the negative um, externalities, such as what C Cecilia pointed out? Um, so with, with that, there are three areas um, that I think... Maybe one sentence about what is the CNU, because I'm not sure everybody's got it. Sorry. Of course, everybody knows who the CNU is now. The, the Congress for the New Urbanism is a U.S.-based organization that has about 5,000 members. We have affiliate organizations uh, across the world with about a, a dozen affiliations. We work to promote vibrant, prosperous places, or as I like to say, build places that people love. Um, so oftentimes, folks will talk about new urbanism as being well-designed, compact, mixed use, with multiple choices about where and how to live live, work, and get around and play. Um, I like to, to bracket it back down to say we like to create an active public realm uh, and a place where people and businesses can thrive and prosper. There's the elevator speech. Yeah, all right. All right, so, um, so uh, Emily and I have been going back and forth on, on the things that, the, the challenges and the leverage uh, moving forward. And every time I said something, she was like, well, that's US based. And so I was like, all right, well, da -da -da -da. <laughs> she was like, well, that's US based. So um, <clears throat> uh, after, because there's a lot of, lot of challenges. So the, the first that I think kind of works across the board that I think we have to incorporate into all of our work. And not in the next 25 years, but we need to do it now in order to get to a success in 25 years is to address head on the increasing um, segregation and the increasing stratification, particularly economic stratification that is occurring in all of our towns and cities. When we are creating place for one socioeconomic demographic, we're leaving others out. Uh, the U.S. has been particularly um, awful at this. Um, as as a, a statistic I heard just recently, that in 2017, the United States is more segregated now than it was in 1960. When we're thinking about how to design our neighborhoods and our communities, how can we do it to ensure equal access to opportunity for all folks? When we are thinking about revitalizing corridors that seen decades of disinvestment, how can we do it in a way that rises all boats? Right? I'm not talking about a massive social program. I'm talking about basic civilities that we should have for one another um, across the board, across all socioeconomic demographics, across all genders, across all races. Um, across all countries of origins. And right now, when we talk about placemaking, when we talk about the built and natural environment, um, as Neil pointed out, very often it's single-minded and very often it's exclusionary. If we don't start addressing the issues of uh, segregation and stratification, um, all of the goals that we have talked about in these last several days and that CNU members talk about all the time will fall on deaf ears. Placemaking is not for the 1% for the 99%. Uh, so that's one challenge that nice will sentence. be, um, uh, it's a tweetable quote. Uh, anyway. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, the other, the, the second trend, and I'm gonna feel so passe in saying that because if 25 years ago somebody was to say this, and I'm sure it's been said every year, but is the role of technology. Um, 
absolutely technology has changed how we're doing public engagement, has changed how we move around. But moving forward, think even bigger about the ways it can disrupt how we design and build and inhabit communities. And I'll just give you one example of this. Again, I'm thinking very broadly around placemaking, not so much the, 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 the tactical urbanism and, and activating the space, but designing um, and building communities out, out of whole cloth or revitalizing the urban cores or transforming the suburbs. And this is around electricity. Um, right now, particularly in the United States, and this is a, a, across the world as well, Puerto Rico is facing this, I'm sure in the informal settlements, uh, having a, an electric grid is, has been very centralized. And when we talk about going to solar panels and uh, generating more energy in those panels so we sell it back to the grid and when we need it, we take it from the grid, that requires a whole series of micro decisions that cannot be done now with a human and therefore there have been policies and regulations put into place that, that essentially prevent that type of small scale energy generation. What happens if we move to artificial artificial intelligence where computers are able to design systems to make those micro decisions. It, it could be transformative. And I think that too, for the US, this is a national security issue. Sometime in August or September, Phoenix, Arizona was at 120 degrees for like 10 or 12 days. No, climate change isn't happening. No, not at all, right? So <laughs> what happens if somebody who's not very nice uh, and is mad at us, and there's not many of those people in the world, um, went in and shut down the grid and there was no air conditioning in Phoenix? Right. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, a huge problem. What happens when you're in some of your informal settlements and it, the heat really goes, uh, wh what are we going to do? Now imagine if everyone had solar panels, if everyone had different types of batteries, if we had the technological wherewithal to make those micro decisions mm -hmm. across, all of a sudden now the decentralized, decentralization of the electric grid is now done at a neighborhood or block level. And if we can do that with technology, what does that mean for other areas of disruption? We've already seen how technology is disrupting um, uh, where and how we get around with Uber and everything else. Emily's telling me to wrap it up. So I, I think that the role of technology um, is really going to be something that we can leverage moving forward to help all of our efforts, particularly some of the global issues that, um, that Cecilia brought up. And then finally, I wanna talk about the role of local government. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but I recently heard that when the Paris Climate Accords was passed, about 700 cities signed on to it. After the U.S. pulled out, that number went up to 7,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What this tells you, what this tells you is not how we need to provide more national leadership. No, what this tells you is that there is an incredible opportunity for leadership at the local level. Now, more than ever, we're seeing disruption happen as many countries across the world are facing kind of a, a, a leadership crisis at the national level. So yes, the US is the worst, but, um, but, it, but it's just not us. There's this entire- there, There's some other bad ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an entire reordering going on and this provides an incredible opportunity for local governments. And I'm not just top down, but once you're working at the local scale, those context specific solutions that we've been talking about have a real, uh, real chance of amplifying in neighborhoods across the city. Um, so when we're talking about addressing the issues of equity and segregation, what the local government does is an incredible opportunity for leadership. So those are the areas in which I'm thinking about how it impacts our work moving forward, looking at, again, uh, the role of, of segregation and equity, how technology can help us, and then how can we support local governments to provide even more leadership. Thank you. Wow. So that's an easy agenda and set of challenges to live up to. There is Nate over here somewhere. There's supposed to be a way for you guys to write questions and then they appear on the screen. Uh, is that, ah, there we go. So now you know how to send questions up to the screen and then we can take those questions as we go along. But before we do that, Gil. Okay, I don't have slides, but and, I also need to stand up. And Lynn took six up. minutes, so you can take six minutes. Yeah, but you made me talk about seeing you. I, 
Placemakers. <laughs> I think that we have a great opportunity, but we also have a huge responsibility. Today we got 3.5 billion people living in cities. Within the lifetime of the people that are at university today, our children, grandchildren, we're going to double to over 7 billion. It has never happened before and will never happen again because already the rate of growth is very low, but since there are so many more children and youth, it's going to continue for another 40 years. So if we are, not only do we have to improve the cities that we have today, but we got to create great cities yeah. for 3.5 billion people in the next 40 years. So let's think, how have we done our cities in the last 40? Because if we've been doing good, let's just do more of the same. But as Cecilia showed, what we have done overwhelmingly, the, the overwhelming majority in the last 40 years is horrible. Horrible. In all continents, almost without exception. It's not only in developing countries, it's also in developed countries. We have been building, thinking more on car, car, cars than thinking on people's happiness. And what we have done Clearly, it doesn't work. Placemaking is great because when we're talking about creating cities, at the end of the day, is not places, placemaking as acupuncture, one here, one there. But if we have hundreds, thousands, millions of places, great places, then they create a city and then the crea city creates a country and so on. But I want to ask everyone in this room, placemakers, when you do placemaking, please be a guardian angel of the gentle majority. Who's the gentle majority? The children, the older adults, the poor. Let's evaluate cities by how well we treat the most vulnerable people. And they are the most vulnerable, the children, the older adults, and the poor, and they gotta be part of placemaking. The children, for example, children, all children around the world should have a play area within 400 meters. All of them. Not because it's fun and games, which is fun and games, but also because that's how children learn. They develop the cognitive thinking, they socialize, they develop friendship, they develop a sense of belonging. And even in the poor areas, even, it's even more important because when you live in a 30 square foot home, you don't live there, you sleep, you live outside. So the low income areas need better sidewalks and better bikeways and better parks and better connectivity. The children, the older adults, we're living longer, not longer, much, much longer. You know, 200 years ago, we didn't have any country in the world with a life expectancy above 45. Today, we don't have any below 45. So it's clear that we have learned how to survive. But now we need to learn how to live with the issues of climate change and economic crisis and public health, mental, physical, and so on. Older adults is the biggest waste of resource that we have around the world. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left and they're healthier and wealthier and more active with more knowledge, with more education. They could be the champions of placemaking all over the world. Let's engage older adults. Mm -hmm. And then the poor. The poor, it's amazing. Even in the wealthiest country in the world, the U.S., Almost in every city, you go to areas of the city where the life expectancy is 60 years. And 10 minutes away, the life expectancy is 90. And I don't know what is worse, that this happens or that most people are starting to think that that's normal. No, that's not normal that someone just depending on what part of the city they are born are going to live 50% more. The issue of poverty is critical. It cannot be that in countries like the US, Canada, Israel, one out of five children live in poverty. When in countries like Denmark, it's one out of 37. So things can be different. We certainly have to do things differently in so many ways. Finally, I wanna mention placemakers. This is not a technical issue. This is not a financial issue. This is a political issue. A political issue. That's why everybody needs to participate. Everybody. Citizens can no longer be spectators. We need to develop alliances between elected officials and public sector staff and the community, the activists, the universities, the business, everybody. And what is the glue that is going to link elected officials, public sector, and the community? 
is developing a shared vision and a sense of urgency. We don't have 25 years, we don't have 40 years, we need to act now. In 40 years, we're gonna have twice as many people living in cities. So what a great opportunity, but what a huge responsibility because whatever we do or don't do in the next 40 years is how people are gonna live. Billions and billions of people are gonna live for hundreds of years. So let's make it not only a challenge, but a great opportunity, and let's start working now. And placemaking has a very important role to play in all of this process. Thank you. And you wanted to use slides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's amazing. So one of the, oh no, now they're going down. And so one of these questions up here is, are we making enough progress with regard to improving urban areas with an emphasis on help, health, and how could we speed up? Whose question was that? Just raise a hand. Maybe it's someone, ah, out there. Okay, great. Uh, anybody of the four of you think we're making enough progress and we don't need to speed things up? Oh, no, 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 no. All right. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, so the, that piece is clear. Urgency, urgency, urgency over here, I think, comes out really strongly from all of you. So how to speed it up, how to scale it up, to go back to something Ethan said this morning. Who wants it? Well, I'll, oh, no, you go ahead. Because yeah, I talk all the time. Yeah, it, it strikes me that one of the reasons we need to, to scale up good health and well-being is that we have, broadly speaking, an economy which is ill health producing. Uh, it's not good health producing. Um, and so it needs a reorganization of the economy. And the reorganization of the economy involves three economies. It involves wealth creation through commercial economy. That needs to be harnessed by the public economy and taxation and the local state and nation state. But it also involves the social economy too. And all those three are equally important to create good health and good wealth. So I think we need to recalibrate how we organize places uh, and, and so that the commercial, the public, and the social have equal play within a locality and within any given Neil, jurisdiction. I didn't understand that. Okay. If you look to, uh, say, um, Barcelona, where I was this week, what you've got there is an appreciation that the global economy, the commercial economy, is not serving the people of Barcelona particularly well. And so what they're seeking to do is to enhance the public, public economy, the local state, the taxation, mm -hmm. to do more things and harness some of that wealth better. And it's also through the commons and through citizens' platforms enabling the social economy to shine through. And in Barcelona, they've got, it's almost two sides of the same coin. One, we can play within the global economy, we need to temper it to fit this place. And also we're going to accentuate the social economy and the public economy to look after the wealth and the economy and the health of the citizens of Barcelona. See, I would, um, I, what I'm about to say is very much in a U.S. context because it gets into the nitty gritty. Right now in the, the U.S., our Department of Transportation spends billions of dollars on transportation around a performance metric called level of service, which is how fast can cars move through a particular area to change, to really amplify or to scale up <clears throat> how we create cities, what happens if that money was instead spent on access to mobility, how fast we're moving people from point A to point B. What about if we change our economy, changing our, 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 our grants that go, our, our, both our grants and the, the funds from the federal government to US states and cities around a place-based economy? We no longer have have the time or the resources for single objective spending. We now need to spend all of our funds that come at the federal, state, and local level in ways that meet multiple community outcomes. And that has been holding, at least in the US, back, and I think also in our, our European areas. So a little bit about what, what Neil was saying, changing the economy. If we change our metrics on how we spend that money, that's one easy, easy way uh, of ampl amplifying it. And I, I will say I left the federal government after 14 years because I was working on this issue and it just about killed me. 
So maybe that's an argument for going in first and then, and then <laughs> coming back on out. You know, someone wrote a qu not a question, but a statement. Fred Kent for the U.S. president. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Fred is my mentor. I have learned so much from you and everything, and we are so grateful for the seeds that you plant all over the world. Yeah. Thank you. No, clearly we're not doing things right. We see countries like India, where less than 10% of the households have cars. And we see billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent on elevated highways. When people cannot walk or bike. You know, every less than two minutes, a person driving a car kills a person walking around the world. That's not civilized. And we know how to eliminate that. They are not accidents, they are incidents because they could be eliminated. In the U.S., one out of three children, or actually more, 40% of the children, 40% do not have a park within walking distance. The children living in cities, not even the rural areas, in cities. So clearly what we have done is not. We need to change. From the point of view of housing, mm -hmm. we have left housing up to supply and demand. Supply and demand works when there is supply and there is demand. If I'm making these clickers and I charge too much money, then Ethan is going to make them and charge less, and then the price is going to come down. But the land is the same. It doesn't matter how much demand, there's going to be the same supply. So as long as we leave it up to supply and demand, the poor people in developed and developing countries all over the world are going to be pushed further away to the worst places, the most difficult to bring water and sewage and electricity and work and mobility and hospitals and everything. The few countries where they are not homeless is because the government has had a major intervention. So somehow we can debate how much intervention, but when you go to Singapore, they say, oh, what is your problem with homeless? Oh, they don't have homeless. Why? Because everybody has homes. And then you go to, I was working in Copenhagen two days ago, and I was in Malmo the, last week, and in the Scandinavia, most of, but why? You cannot buy two homes in Copenhagen, even if you wanted to. If you are living outside in another country, you cannot buy. There are a lot of restrictions. They took the housing out of the market. If you rent a house, you will pay the same rent for life. You're, it will increase only by, by inflation. So clearly governments have to intervene in this issue or else we're going to continue doing favelas and slums all over the world and this is going to be a huge crisis and it's going to get worse as we double the population around the world. No, I can actually only agree with Gil. I think that local governments and governments need to be empowered and to actually be able to uh, support their citizens in, well, first of all, maybe they need to understand what they need to do. Uh, and I think there's also this uh, dialogue between the citizens and local government, which is not taking place. And I know there are quite a few local government representatives here in the audience. And I think this is actually critical. The local governments need to understand what the citizens need, and especially taking into consideration the most marginalized, which Gil was talking about earlier. You know, when cities can do that, then you know, we can have a better world to live in. But I think just this thing about empowering local governments, empowering them with the frameworks, with the legal frameworks, but other um, tools somehow to be able to deliver, providing them the financial mechanisms for how to actually um, be able to plow money into creating good quality public spaces. It's not clear for a lot of the governments that we work with on the local level. They don't know how to do that. So how can we actually help them? And I think this is where this knowledge which is in this room and other placemakers can actually take that role and do that. You want to say something yeah, else? Just Go on the it. point of local government, um, I, there's a new thing, I don't want to introduce a new term, but there's a new municipalism afoot around the world. There's the fearless cities movement, there's the rebel cities movement. This is local state stepping into the market in a different way. It's not stepping into the old top-down, we, we with the municipal power. It's actually creating platforms for citizens to do things in a different way. We're seeing the massive rise of co-ops. We're seeing a massive rise of municipal energy. We're seeing a massive rise of local state enabling citizens to do things differently. And this is the new politics that we need to go into. It's on the margins. It's alternative. It needs to become the new mainstream. Politics, uh, who's, I think it's Ada Kalau, the, the mayor of Barcelona, she has this great phrase, politics is an agora. It's not a temple. It's this democratic space. 
and what local governments, therefore, is to be the guardians of democracy in all its forms, not to be an edifice like a town hall with a command and control. So there's a new spirit rising, I feel, and a new citizens' movement. Well, and this, I think, this but, agenda but, but, needs to I, go on to I want to take it. off on that for a second. Surely. There's a new spirit rising. That's lovely. There's another new spirit rising, and that's a new spirit of nationalism and xenophobia and anti-migration. NIMBY. And, NIMBY's been around for a long time, but, but NIMBY really... of not in my backyard, but getting up and stronger and gated and segregation and separation. How does placemaking help address that? And I'm linking that one of the questions up here is we've heard a lot about inclusion. Take a quick look. Is this an inclusive audience? The person who asked the question said this isn't an inclusive audience. This is not a diverse movement. How do we change that? So this issue of migration, xenophobia, is that an opportunity for placemaking? Any of you? No, none of you want to answer that one, <laughs> Cecilia. I think that's no, you. No, but the, but you raised. I, I wanted to to take that. Okay, ignore me. Go ahead. No, I, it's I'm, fine. That's I, fine. I, I'm okay, going to address it's completely it. fine. But one of the issues that we were talking about before, and 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 we've had this conversation almost all day amongst mm -hmm. the amongst the five of us is yes, let's listen to the citizens. Let's empower the citizens. Yet at the same time, if the citizens are saying, I don't want to have any blacks in this area, I don't, I don't want, I want to have a gate. Like there's so many different ways that citizens can have their voice, but it's not necessarily in ways that we feel are getting to the outcomes that, that we're saying. No, we don't want to take in any refugees. No, we don't want to have integrated schools. Um, it, where I live in, in uh, Arlington County, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., um, a citizens movement um, recently derailed uh, a streetcar line that had been in the works for the last 10 years. And I was upset because the role of government is to see the greater good and to see, yeah, you need to make decisions that will help everybody, not a few lo local. So as we talk about this rise of local voices, which I completely support, there's also a role of local government to make decisions for the greater good. And that tension is being played out in different ways. And I don't think we have a, a good path forward yet. Gil, did you want to chime in on that one? Yes, I, I think that we need to change, clearly. Sorry, and to no, change, three recommendations when you go out and do placemaking. First, change is not unanimous. Sometimes cities don't do things because, oh, not everyone is on board. No, never. When you are changing, never. You would have to water down change so much that it will not be changed any longer. So first, change is not unanimous. Second, in any meeting, you got to have as a rule, the general interest must prevail over the particular. So when you're going to say, we'll have a me public meeting about widening a sidewalk, and people say, oh, but my business. Has no, 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 no. Don't tell me about your business. Give me the same argument, but frame it on the general interest. So the general interest must prevail over the particular. And three, when you say no to something, you are also saying yes to something else. So if you say uh, no to a park, no to a bikeway, no? you are also saying yes to more obesity, yes to more sprawl, yes to more bad quality of air, and so on. So all of this. And keep in mind, change is always hard everywhere. Don't think that in Paris, when they eliminated 5,000 cars parking for the public bikes, it was easy. And don't think that in Bogota, when we had 280 kilometers of protected bikeways, 20 years ago, when there was not a centimeter of bikeway from Alaska to the Patagonia, it was easy. We tend to think that in the other provinces it's easy, in the other countries, in the other cities. No, always it's going to be hard. But nevertheless, it's doable, and we need to really take. And the issue of placemaking is that also we need to consider everybody. Don't do placemaking. The other day I was at a session of placemaking in a community, mm -hmm. and they were talking about an under, an, an, a, a skateboard park under a bridge and an area of visible minority. Mm -hmm. And it was very fancy facilitator from New York. And then I said, what do you think? How is this going? And he said, great. It's full. Everybody's very engaged. I said, yeah, but you know, the skateboard parks are mostly for 10 to 24-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And this is visible minority, low income. And everybody in the room was over 40, very white, very well-educated. Yeah. And he said, oh, they didn't show up. I said, what? He said, we put an ad on the paper. No. <laughs> I said, you know, 14-year-olds, they don't read newspapers. 14-year-olds, they don't go to a, a place-making event at 7 p.m. at a five-star hotel. Right. So if we, we, if we honestly want to listen to the citizens, we need to change 
Fred says that when you focus on place, you do things differently. Part of it, doing different things, is actually go to the citizens. Get some pizza, go at 3 o'clock when they're coming out of school and ask them. Go to the immigrant communities and ask them in their language, at their own time, at their own pace. And we need to engage. So we honestly got to do things different. This Placemaking cannot be just something that we, it's just a check. So that when we go to the city council and they say, did you go to the community? Yes, checked. Because otherwise we're doing a huge damage to placemaking. And Neil, you're, you're, I, sorry, I know you want sorry. to chime in, but I also want to ask you this question here of sure. what's the value of private places? Sure. I want to ask that one back to you with the emphasis on redoing the economy. Can I just make a small point on, yep. on what, what Gil was saying there? Uh, ju just on, I will come back to that, uh, but, and I'll be, be brief. Is that I think there's something about placemaking that we know what's kind of right, but we need to translate that into the practice of statecraft and local statecraft. And that's, it's all very well having nice sentiments that we need to change with respect. We actually need to drill that down into the democratic process we have and disrupt them. And that is the task we've got in now. And the way I see this is that we've got across the world different types of social contracts, different types of deal, different types of social democratic perhaps contracts. We're actually in a phase now, we're building new social contract. We're in what Gramsci would say, Antonio Gramsci, the interregnum. The old world is creaking. We're moving into a new one, but it's not settled yet. And we are all cursed and lucky. We're cursed because we're living in these horrible times with the, all the things we've just seen. But we're lucky because we're creating a new social contract. And we need to get policies and work really hard to take what's in our heart, what Gil was expressing, into the policy environment. And in that, there is places. The, go to look what's happening in Preston, in Lancashire, the Preston model. This is a place which is actually saying we are going to build a new local social contract based on principles around fairness, reciprocity, respect and solidarity. There's a new social contract to be built in our countries and in our localities. That's what we need to be getting on. We need to get past the idea that we need to change and keep moaning. We need to start getting into doing and infecting the policy process and the mm -hmm. democratic processes. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Hey, Ethan, I told you we would ask you to come back up, please. Uh, one of these questions is how do we keep placemaking as a community-led movement? And you said something super interesting, to, one of the many super interesting things you said this afternoon was about how in each of the different countries that we're hearing from here, there's a different sector leading. And I wondered if you could reflect on that one. What's okay. the role of the community, the governments, all of that? Okay, and so now I don't have to. Yeah, and I'll try. And I, and I, I got excited about a couple of your questions before, so I'll okay. try to circle back to a couple of those, <laughs> maybe cool. as well. But, uh, but yeah, so we're finding that you know each 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 part of the world is, is leading in different ways and, and holding back in, in, in the same way. So if if the, if the government's leading with, with placemaking, really inspiring, let's learn from that. But often in the process, they're they're doing it in ways that the community doesn't feel like they need to do it. So you know the the, the general theory is that we, we need them all to be we need to set it up so everyone's competing to contribute. So they're all. Uh, rather than competing to take value is, is, is the paradigm we have right now. Everyone's, you know, the way we're doing development, the way we're doing, um, you know, gated communities is this fear-based thing. So the, we need to shift the paradigm. We need to, and the way to, you know, the way to bridge difference and, uh, um, and you know, d d the migrants, this fear, this fear dimension is, is, is to show people that we, that we, we can win. And my, uh, actually, my oh. wife does placemaking with refugees in, in, uh, in the U.S. And, um, and you know, and it creates this win-win dynamic between the refugees and the host communities. When, but it's a comfortable one. And rather than focusing on the difference or the problem, you're focusing on how you you build um, what what are your shared goals, your shared needs for these spaces, and you start to realize that both all these parties have different ways to contribute. And we, we're part of a program on peacemaking and, and placemaking uh, with, with a, the colleague in, in Lebanon, um, in, in a network of people researching how placemaking can, can, is a tool. For, for bridging difference and for but for also more fundamentally changing relationships through through changing places, um, but I do think I do think we're you know we're definitely in a crisis of of, of global leadership um, and you know a crisis of of, uh, of of leadership on many scales and that leads to an opportunity as Lynn put really well that you know, for 
for leadership uh, from, on, on, from localities, from, all, from, from, from communities. But I also think we're at, at a crisis of leadership of, you know, what are the answers? Uh -huh. There's this, it's this very ripe, uh, you know, fertile time uh -huh. um, where, where uh, for amongst urbanists as well, it's, it's you know, we all, there's, we're, we're all connected now. A lot of people know each other globally, the World Urban Forums, the, the um, yeah. and Habitat 3 has brought all these people together and so exciting, but it's also like, wait a minute, we, you know, everyone's got some pieces, but no one really knows where we're going. And that, but the, again, that, that's what we, that's the time, it's, it's an opportunity to, to, to collectively start to work together and, 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 and collaborate, it requires collaboration, it requires leadership on all levels. And I think, I think it's through, so, 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 so two focuses are gonna bring around the, the paradigm shift, I think, is that we, it's, it's it, you know, we need to focus on public space, but we need, and there's been a lot of attention to that in the new urban agenda and the sustainability, um, sustainable development goals. Um, but the quality of, of, of that space, the degree people have, have ownership over it, basically we need, I think we need to help demonstrate that when shared wealth, when there's a higher proportion of shared wealth in a community to private wealth, and we need private wealth, private spaces are, are important. We need a full spectrum of public to private in a healthy community. Um, but when there's a higher proportion of shared wealth, we have to show how that creates those are the communities that we in. Those are the communities that people want to be a part of. Uh, and I think, you know, the Congress for an Urbanism, the lovable community idea, that the, this, it's not just livable that, 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 uh, that we consume, where we consume cities, but um, they're, they're showing this really well. Um, but, uh, but I think ultimately it's actually not just through lots of great public spaces everywhere, but it's through, it's, it's, it's ultimately, it's, it's the examples that we've seen today uh, and, and yesterday, it's, it's, it's small destinations that, that, uh, that show a whole new vision. The examples we saw from Placemaking Week in, in Nairobi, um, you know, up to these sort, of, uh, these sort of innovation hubs, we're calling them, is these places that bring together new, new ideas around the economy, new ideas um, around place that demonstrate people working together in new ways, people, can, you know, all can, shaping their place, their economy, their, their culture, it's in these places where culture is going to change, new models are going to change, and they're, they're going to go viral. Uh, it, it's, it, so it's, it's, it's small efforts that, that can make a huge impact because everyone's going to want to be part of this and show mm -hmm. that it's more fun, and this is how cities are going to succeed most in the future. Okay. <laughs> uh, why, did, did you want to say something? Small, I, I think I totally agree with uh, what Ethan said. I just wanted to add also all the small actions are important, but they are not enough because we're in a huge crisis. Over 28 countries in Africa are gonna double the population by 2050. In those countries, there are many cities that are gonna triple and quadruple the population. So just small, even in developed countries, the US is gonna grow by one third the population by 100 million people. In Canada, all the large cities are gonna increase by 50% in the next 25 years. We don't have too much time to think. We need to act. And so, so the small issues are nice, but I see also many people, they go to New York and they see Bryant Park and they, they copy and paste Bryant Park all over in Buenos Aires and in Mexico and whatever. No, 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 stop copying and pasting. Let's adapt and improve and localize and make it local. Let's see how it works. It's not just about doing cute things. Sometimes we hear, uh, we talking about all the routes, we say, oh, let's, we, we have over-engineered the streets, so let's take out all of the signs. What? My mom is 87, she doesn't hear well. Do I want her to go out and negotiate eye to eye with a truck driver in the middle of a rain at night? <laughs> she might win 99% of the times, but one time she loses, she's gonna be dead. <laughs> So, so, so let, let, let's, be, let's be careful with some of these things that work in very specific and isolated areas and let's make it all, and let's do something massive. Acupuncture works well, but if we find a way that that acupuncture eventually will be linked and have a huge yeah. impact citywide, Otherwise, uh, you know, of course, it's not going to be bad, but it's not really going to be what we need. If we have a city of a million or two or 10 million and we got three to 10 nice places, uh, that is not making any difference. I, I think when we, we were talking about the need to scale up and to amplify, um, building on a little bit of what Cecilia was saying, it's not all bad news. Right, if you think about where the conversation was 20 years ago about where and how communities could be built, 
what I'm finding in my work, not, not only with CNU, but when we were working at the federal level, that the conversation had changed, not what is this, but rather how do we do it? And that's a huge change. Yeah. It's yeah. rare that you run into a governor or a mayor that will say, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what this is. Tell me what this is. But rather, how can I do it within my own context, yeah. within my own limitations? How can I redevelop a corridor or four block stretch of corridor to leverage a new light rail station in a community that is 38% refugee and 70% low income? How can we do it in a way that ensures that everyone can, can stay in and benefit from that wealth creation? And, and that's the piece that I do want us to move forward with. There's a lot of successes. Gil's right. It can't be a copy and paste. But on the other hand, if you get a good idea from another city, another country, another person, adapting that and replicating that, that's the, that's the real value of us getting together, is taking ideas, solutions, strategies, and approaches and amplifying it and really getting into the nitty gritty. I, I loved how Emily was pushing back on me earlier when I, when I said something, she goes, how do you do it? And I think we're, we're done with a point now of talking so, about why so when, we should do um, something. Um, but hold on, last thing, ahead. but we now need to get to a point of how do you do it? A couple of times when Gil was talking, I wanted to say, okay, how? How are we going to build more housing that's not top down in a socialist right. context? Some places are done with why and are moving over to how. Mm. But I think we were hearing a lot from the session on Africa, from some of the mm. more global mm. sessions, mm. that there are an awful lot of places that are not yet on how, that are still on why should I do this. For those places, Cecilia, do you want to give us a yeah. final That's charge? Where do we go? See, I'm, I'm, I'm doing <coughs> the same thing that I keep doing. Yeah. No, and, and I actually feel that there is a lot of goodwill from local governments that um, probably don't have the knowledge or the tools of what to do, yeah. but they would really like to make a difference. And, you know, you, you have these champions in local government. Yeah. I mean, it can be a mayor, it can be a head of a department mm -hmm. that is a champion, but how do you actually leverage that support to then have that, and I like mm -hmm. what Gil says, we have to have a citywide approach. And, you know, it's not enough just doing these little acupunctures. We need to have a citywide approach. We need to go to scale. We need to make sure that that happens. And we can only do that when there is that goodwill in government to be able to do that. And I think there's, there is a lot. Um, I think we need the grassroots to push. Yeah. They push upwards. You need the goodwill in government to be able to take that forward. And you need to have all the frameworks in place to be able to move it. You need to have the legislation. You need to have um, the different financial mechanisms as well because you can't do it without the financial mechanisms. And I think this is also really important. And that links a lot with what Neil is trying to do. You know, How can local governments capture the value of a good quality public space, plow that back into more disadvantaged communities, create new spaces, protect the spaces that exist and uh, make sure that, that we have a much liv more livable city. Okay, thanks. I think we're on closing statements, last, last word, so go okay. for it. No, I, I think that when Cecilia was talking, uh, Cecilia's from UN Habitat, I remember when I was a teenager, I, was in, I went to Vancouver because by coincidence, my father was the head of UN Habitat. He organized the conference in 76, which was the largest conference the yeah. UN had organized, mm -hmm. and that's where UN Habitat was created. Yes. And maybe there was something in the air, because years later, one of my brothers, the two of us went, now he's mayor of Bogota, and I've been dealing with cities for over 30 years in more than 300 different cities. I think that at that time, we. Very few cities were talking about this, and I totally agree with it. Now the big step is that everybody's talking, but very few are doing. So now we gotta move from talking to doing. Maybe 30 years ago, it was like if we were not even in the soccer field, we were gonna go to the soccer or the football field, and we were even outside of the stadium. Now we are on the stadium, and actually now we're on the field. We have learned how to pass the ball around. Yeah. But if the ball doesn't cross the line, we don't score a goal. We need to learn how to, how to cross the line, otherwise we're not gonna score goals. And we really gotta move from talking to doing. And everywhere people are gonna say, oh yes, we are doing, of course, everybody's doing. But we gotta do more and we gotta do it faster. 
and the placemakers around the world, all of you that are champions, got to keep that in mind. And we need to also diversify the placemaking movement. It's not just for the white upper class educated in most countries, but it's for everybody in order to bring it up, down, down, up, sideways, everywhere, because the task is enormous. But what a great opportunity that all of us have in front of us. Wow. Okay. Neil, Lynn, closing, yeah. closing yeah. words. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, my organisation, Centre for Local Economic Strategy, is all about thinking and doing. And uh, what's interesting about our organisation in the last five years is that we did a lot of thinking. We were a policy organisation. I mean, still, I'm a policy geek, you can tell by the spectacles. Uh, yeah. um, we have moved into doing because that's the moment we're in in, and Gil's perfectly correct, that's the moment we're in in society. And um, I'm a big fan of Roberto Unger. Uh, he's a Harvard uh, law professor and also I think a Brazilian politician was and philosopher. And Roberto Unger says this is the age of experiments. Experiments that foreshadow the big change. Yeah, so that idea, that Gramsci idea in the middle. Age of experiments. And I think in different parts of the world there's more experiments than others. Yeah. What, we're, what we've got to move into is a, a theory of change. Age of experiments to the age of amplification to the age of transformation. And I think we're just at the footholds of this in many places. We're only in the kind of experimental stage. And what we need to do, we've got this human flourishing, horizontal power, and we're all part of that movement, and good on. And there needs to be more and more and more and many of it. It needs to grow and grow and grow. But this is a political project, folks. This is a democratic project. We've got an economy. The rising tide does not lift all boats. It, lives, it lifts the super yachts. So we need to get this human flourishing and we need to get vertical power to change. And the axis is so important. This is a political project. It's not a landscape design project. It's not a nice well-being project. It's a political project. And we need to get into that space. And maybe we've not got the skill set for it. That means we need to align ourselves with citizens' movements and democratic projects around the world. If it's political parties, if it's citizens' movements, I don't care. Just get involved in them and start to convey the importance of place within the political sphere so we can change a new, get a new political economy in our localities and across the world. Thanks. So one of the rants that I have had um, for, for about the last 15 years, um, and it was rekindled recently uh, at one of our annual gatherings, and, and again here, whenever I'm, when I'm around amazing people like yourselves, I find that we push each other away by the words that we use. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, here you all are using placemaking, lighter, quicker, cheaper. We call it new urbanism. If we go to new partners for smart growth, they're going to call it sustainable urbanism. If you go to China, they're going to call it you know, something else. But everybody here in this room, I can get pretty much agreement across the board in about five minutes by putting up a good picture, and we talk about the characteristics of place. We talk about the outcomes. Neil's absolutely right that we are a movement and we need to work together. And that means working across mm. from smart growth to placemakers, from, from new urbanism to <coughs> the green building. We all need to be pulling in the same direction. And the only way that we're going to get on that board to work together is if we stop talking in code to one another and to the folks in the communities and we start talking about outcomes. Stop yeah. using slang term of like, oh, this is smart growth, this is new urbanism, this is placemaking, and start more about what we are trying to achieve on the ground. I have been in so many meetings where the, where the words are being used with community members, and they're like, oh, and they're like, ped shed? What the hell's a ped shed, right? <laughs> right? Let's, let's instead say what we, can, what, what we can do. What Emily and Ethan have challenged, us, or challenged me is like, what can you do walking out of here? And if there's one, I, I love the, 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 the poetic nature uh, of some of our panelists, but I'm just going to bring it down to one simple thing. Stop talking in code, and let's start talking about what we want to achieve 
And I think using the words will start building a more powerful movement and a more powerful movement will bring the political power um, and the successes that we're achieving. Very Thank good. you. I'll say a little bit. Um, I think part of what really impressed me in these last two days, moving off of what you said, Lynn, is the, is the images, is the pictures and the passion that people are bringing. It feels like every time one of us in this room is doing something, back to what you said, Gil, we're inspiring a whole bunch of other people yeah. out there to do more. Mm -hmm. And so even though most of this panel has been about go further, go faster, go get elected mayor, mm -hmm. go get all the budgets into all the oh. place-led movements, go change the world, I want to also bring it back. The daily practice sounds, this is my small insight, the daily practice going on here, that's what's creating the leadership. Mm -hmm. Each time each person here is doing something, there's another leader who's coming out of it who seems to be taking it to the next place. So starting with the doing and the creating the leadership, and then what you guys are doing with STIPO and with placemakers and this kind of a conference of networking all of the talkers and the doers together, I think is extraordinary. Yeah. It's just so hugely inspirational to get to be part of it and to go back with that to my little place and try to inspire a few more people Absolutely. around me and then to try to do, I think, what, what you're saying, to connect to people with real power to really change the way the budgets are made, the way the regulations are made, to not be afraid of going deep into the mainstream, to not be afraid of trying to make those changes, to not rest contented on mm. our single spaces and efforts. That's me. That's good. Um, That's good. That needs to clap that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think this is a challenge. I think you know, this is hopefully a shift for all of us. If we're all very comfortable sitting within our solutions, with our, with our cause, with our language. Um, and I think, you know, there was a great presentation uh, about the sort of the, um, how placemaking is always dealing with, with the sort of dualities, with tensions. Mm -hmm. And I think we have, to, we have to move into that, into the, these tensions and, you know, obviously broaden this conversation, bring, uh, em embrace that. But I think that it means, it means really recentering the conversation, you know, in communities, in, in outcomes and in, in, in places. And... Uh, and I do, I do think the, the focus on place is, 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 a, is a way that allows people to, to, uh, to be comfortable, to question what it is, to, to, to look at images, as, as you talked about, that are, that are, in, that are inspiring, and to debate um, you know, what, what, what the different purposes meaning, but also layer purposes and meaning onto, onto space together. Um, the, uh, it, it, the, the way that that changes culture and the way that you all can facilitate that culture change, I think is the fastest way we're gonna create change that's visible in places, that mm. makes this go viral, um, but also that, that, that develops the new models for governance, for financing, for, for, for development, that are gonna really scale the, the impact um, of, of, of our work. But you all are, you're all, we're all sort of, we, we're all sort of vessels for this conversation, not for necessarily the solutions. Some, you know, the language and our professional hats and our backgrounds our, our tools to get in the door, but it's how we how we bridge how we use place to to, to bridge relationships with with other disciplines, with other places, with other difference. That's where the creativity and the new models are are going to emerge, um, and where, where where the fun is, and that and that's you know that's where we create the the the, the, the step change. We sort of be, go beyond the sort of linear change that, that that really does perpetuate the status quo. I do I really do think that that uh, you know even the best solutions, no matter how good they are, we need to apply them faster, but to fighting for you know, green buildings or, or you know, or, or just even, even, you know, even equity to an extent, we're not actually addressing these causes at a fundamental level by fighting for them independently. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not getting very far. Absolutely. I, I think we, it's, it's about how, you know, how do we, place allows us to look for a, a broader shift that is ultimately, you know, going to be modeled in small ways, but can be scaled to develop the new models that will actually address sustainability, equity, health, in, in more fundamental ways. So it's a fun, it's a fun but it's, it's moving into a continual unknown and, a con and creating a learning network and environment um, that is very human, very humble, uh, yes, but ultimately humble. much more creative and innovative. Humble is good.
you know, and they, let's learn from what, what, what we have learned this week. This morning I was on a great workshop with the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. This is something that anybody can do anywhere. They had That's some rulers of 95 centimeters. And they call, there's a fantastic project called Urban 95. 95 is how the, the height of children of three-year-old healthy children. You go to any city, get an elected official, put him some, this ruler nice. that was this height and nice. had some glasses, nice. put him there and have him walk around Very with nice. that just for a, for a little bit and say, guess what? That is the height of a three-year-old. That's how a three-year-old sees a city. It's, a, it's so simple, that politician will never see a playground or a street or a corner in the same way. Go to the website of Bernard uh, uh, Van Leer Foundation because so simple thing, and that's a common denominator. Who's gonna be against making cities more enjoyable and healthier? Because healthier, because that's when the children also develop their thinking. And, uh, so those kind of things, older adults. Older adults, three times as many older adults are killed in intersection as the proportion of the population. Who does no, who, who's gonna be against a plan to make intersections safe for older adults? No one. So think of those topics that are kind of common and the solutions exist. And, and I really enjoyed that workshop this morning and I think that all of us have been seeing lots of examples. So we, we gotta go out and do, 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 do. Like you said, think and do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we're, we're done. Thank you. So there's lots of questions that were up there. I think all the panelists saw the questions and yeah. maybe we can go on with that after the next session. Thanks again. Yeah, for those who want to leave now, please don't or do. Hi, everybody. Um, for those who were at the Lely uh, Broodplatz on uh, Wednesday evening, um, welcome. I am, I'm, I'm happy to be back at this end of the placemaking week. My name is Natasha van der Berg, and I'm a Dutch moderator and asked to host this last co-creation session. Um, and the idea is this. We're going to go create together the Amsterdam placemaking ambition. Because everybody's talking that you shouldn't be talking anymore but doing. So let's hear from you what your ambitions are the coming weeks. What are, you gonna, what are your takeaways from this week in actually changing your agenda? And we do, we're going to do that in two, in th with two central questions. The first will be, what is your placemaking ambition you take away from this week? And just the second question will be, what's going to be your next step in the short term? So actually tomorrow, next week, um, that you will take in your placemaking practice. So it's the ambition, it's the next step. And how are we going to do that? We're going to use the, 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 the same technical thing we used in the last session. So it's the menti.com. Um, and to get some inspiration, um, uh, uh, we have a short panel of uh, placemakers and some officials of the city of Amsterdam to, to kick off this brainstorm session, this co-creation session. I will invite them shortly uh, on stage, but for one uh, moment I need something else. Um, I was in July, I was in Nairobi. And um, I was there uh, visiting farmers because I'm a member of the Supervisory Board for Fairtrade the Netherlands and I visited Fairtrade farmers. And I was there at a training uh, where they were training new techniques in agriculture, doesn't matter. But the f they had a brilliant technique to energize themselves and instead of applauding a long time, they just did two claps. So I'm gonna do this, one second. Okay, now I want you all to stand and practice this for me. Because we're gonna use that a lot of time. If you agree with something, you want to applaud, you only do it by clapping your hands twice. Okay, I count to three and then you do twice. Left, right, wait. One, two, three. Really effective. In Africa, I learned it from Africans. It's gonna be great. We're gonna do it another time and we're gonna do it. One, two, three. Three, okay, sit down. This is what we're gonna use as a technique 
to show enthusiasm. Um, if you agree with somebody, you're allowed to clap two times. Um, okay, let's see what happens. If I ask the two representatives of the Amsterdam municipality to join me on stage, Schauke Alta, she's the head of the East District of Amsterdam, please. The highest civil servant in our Amsterdam East. Give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Very good. Uh, twice is enough. Very good. And the other person is the head of spatial quality of the city of Amsterdam, Erik van der Kooi. Join me on stage. Very good. Um, great. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, continue uh, getting people on stage in a second. Uh, but I'm going to start with these two. Um, and they are, they are already on the screen. So let's, 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 let's get the conversation started. What do you want? Whatever you, if you want to stand, it's fine. Okay, so uh, Schaukje, can I start with you? We're going to co-create this Amsterdam placemaking ambition. Um, and um, the question is if, what, well, is first a general, what did you, you were one of the hosts of the placemaking week. What, what, what was your feeling with it? How did, did you like it? I loved it. I, wanted to, I would love it to have it every single day. Lots of energy, lots of young people, lots of older people, lots of brains, lots of techniques, lots of... Um, yeah, it's just the energy that makes it happen, I think. And, and what is your, your most important takeaway from a week where all these international people visit our city talking about placemaking? Well, the first thing is that I'm reminded, uh, re-reminded and reminded on the urgency um, uh, of placemaking. Uh, we are working um, uh, on different ways to find forms that fit the fuzz in the outside, uh, and I want to be challenged on that. Uh, and I think the placemaking conference has challenged us all the way, and I'm ready to, to replace the fear of the change uh, and, and, and change it into the, uh, uh, choose the opportunities we can find um, and replace it with um, the possibilities of the wisdom of the crowd. Because I think we are ready to do it and we need to do it in Amsterdam. You've all heard about the big um, uh, um, uh, building plans that are going to happen in the city. Uh, we still want to be this social inclusive city. Uh, so there's no time to waste. We uh, have to do it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think it out. I don't want to be the one that makes um, uh, the focus, bring the focus back on the complex complexity. Because if, if we heard the panel here, it's very complex and it's very dynamic. And it's, if, you, if, if we want to do it all together, we're not going to start. So we're just going to start. And we're going to do it. Um, <laughs> Twice, twice, twice is enough. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah. So I have my personal dedication to um, get the system of Amsterdam ready uh, to make sure that all the challenges that we face uh, to make Amsterdam uh, the most vibrant big village um, uh, in the world, maybe. And, um, <laughs> You can, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, this is, if you don't think it's working, you can you make a longer applause, but I like it. <laughs> you will help, yeah, yeah, that's, oh, you will help, very good. Um, yes, yes you, want to, you want to, we need, we, we, we need each we other. We need to do it yeah. together, right, yeah. What, do you, do you want to respond to that, or? What can I possibly add to that? Um, well, let me first say, Amsterdam is a sweet city. Yes. To rephrase our mayor, um, and uh, I think we can be very proud that we don't have as many problems as other cities have. Uh, in a way, place making can do things for cities. Uh, yeah. We have a long tradition, uh, and we face now some challenges, which I will, uh, uh, which is the growth of the city cannot be outside of the city. We have to grow inside, um, which make building communities one of the most. Uh, challenging parts of the next future and placemaking can help us with this. Uh, so for me, I learned two things, uh, probably more, but um, uh, the short term and the long term uh, things. The long term is how can placemaking um, help us build cohesion uh, in ownership, uh, in, in, in uh, taking care of all the kind of people that are uh, belonging to these places. 
which is in the incredibly uh, difficult because in Amsterdam, the tradition of speaking out loud is very big. So I believe some people have too much noise in the city and some people don't. So, uh, for example, people got privileges out of uh, the 70s who are now living in houseboats and now you know, believe that they are uh, having the privileges to, to stay there and uh, make their own gardens. At, and now we want the city to make metropolitan places for everybody. So how can we learn from long-term coalitions? Uh, and the short term is that we need to make short-term interventions. We're not good in making short-term interventions, learning step by step, improvising. And that's what we can start with tomorrow. Very good. So, so very good. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and the other question I'm going to pose to, to all people here in a few, in, in, after, after the other panelists also have responded is, what kind of next step will you take uh, uh, the, the very shortly? So say Monday, you convene with your team um, at the municipality in East, and uh, what are you going to change? What are you going to take change because this placemaking week was here? Well, one of the most important things is that we, we as public servants should not be, do our work because we are public servants, but we should do it because we are persons. So what I would like to start with is that um, uh, our public servants go on the streets as persons and uh, communicate human, as human, human beings, beings yeah. and not with all the policy and all the questions that they think they have to um, that they think they have to know because they, or else they can't speak with uh, other persons. Uh, so I want to make persons of our public servants so, yeah. because I think persons can speak to other persons and can start making uh, the great thing of, uh, that I picked up from the panel before here. Then that's how we can work on di diversifying. That's how we can adapt. That's how we can localize all the things that are needed. So let's do it as persons and let's not do it as people that have a function, um, but we have to do it together. So I would ah. like to hold hands with everybody. Yes, very out. good. Uh, to, to, well, it's, 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 it's getting better and better. Okay, <laughs> so let's, let's get the other le uh, persons on stage. The co-founder of Placemakers, Katusha Sol, where are you? Join us on stage. Very good. <laughs> where are you? Uh, there she is, one, two, three. Perfect. Um, then uh, Simon van Dommel, who is the director of Lola. Yes, one, two, three. Yep. Uh, Eva de Klerk, uh, some of you have heard her keynote already for Urban Creative. Please join us on stage. Eva. Ooh. Probably didn't make, don't wait. Jesse Job Jorg, founder of We Make, we, founder of We The City. Yes, one, two, three. Yeah. And the last one, Nadia Duink Duiker, owner of Amsterdam Roost. Good. Where the party is. Are they there? Can somebody check? Okay. Hi, this is already great. <coughs> so, two questions. What, uh, what it, did it change or how would you formulate your ambition after this week? Uh, and the other question is, uh, what is going to be the next step in doing on Monday? Let's start. So, uh, for me, the ambition would be to go at a political level as well. Yeah. So, stop. For me, it's really strange because I am actually only doing. So, I'm, I'm less sort of going to a sort of uh, making the, the, the projects also, uh, turning them into a story and a story that is really hitting also uh, a project span project plans at a political level. Yes. So, that's a, a point where I'm... Said, I want to I go from... Doing to actually talking. <laughs> yeah, that is quite strange, huh? Yeah. 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 But for me, for me, so I feel that like uh, the project itself, they, 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 they kind of steer to a certain direction and I feel that, that it, it sort of moves uh, people towards, toward thinking uh, in, a, in a certain way. But I have to find better ways of, 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 of uh, uh, turning these uh, projects into stories okay. and uh, having them have more influence. <coughs> okay, so that's the ambition. Good. So making the project into stories and politicize them actually, uh, um, and that is your ambition. And what's going to be your next step? Uh, so there's uh, yeah, that's a very so there's a, a way that you can uh, a sort of course where you learn how to uh, really write articles, do uh, okay. TV shows, etc. So that's what I'm going to do. Educate yourself. And also, so uh, we are with a 
beautifully international crowd as well. And I'm uh, part of the International Advisory Board in Amsterdam. So for, for me, I'm looking uh, for, uh, uh, to get people from outside to, to, uh, to Amsterdam to really improve the city in many, many, uh, many ways. So also, if you feel like I really, really want to shift Amsterdam towards a better, better city. If you have ideas for that, you, exactly. can, you can contact you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to change Amsterdam from an outside perspective... The whole metropolitan region. The whole region. And that's, the whole world. that's yeah. almost <laughs> it, yeah. You can contact him. Okay, thanks. Yes. <laughs> very good. Hi. Um, I, my ambition, I was very inspired by uh, the Placemaking Week and also see it as a yeah, global movement. We had panels on... Yeah, various regions and uh, I felt like um, being part of really something global but which is also important on the local level uh, and I work with a lot of communities uh, and, and local projects here in Amsterdam and I want to uh, spread this awareness and also like for example my students were here and they were also wow we're doing some things that are part of something much bigger. more bigger uh, and I really like to spread that in uh, projects on the ground like all those okay. placemakers. Very good. So, 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 getting the word out and connecting to people, and making sure that everybody knows we're in an international movement. That's your ambition. And what is your next step? Um, yeah, my next step is um, actually something that also has to do with the uh, local government, because I feel like uh, if you're a local placemaker, that it's good to be acknowledged also by the local government as yeah. a local placemaker, and then. It, and, for example, have more flexibility in regulations or more uh, connections with, uh, for example, human uh, policy, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Amtenaren. Um, policy makers, which are actually human beings, yes. yes. Uh, and that's, I really like the, the, uh, your yeah, talk. Them to into yeah, and I would like to... <laughs> And I like to organize something where we can have like a, um, a common learning trajectory for both placemakers on the local level and local policymakers. I don't know why I'm doing this because there's so many mics. Use that mic, please. Um, uh, can you uh, one? What is the ambition? Two? What's your next step, please? Yeah. Um, well, but I, I like like the words as well because um, uh, a civil servant is a, as a person after five o'clock and before nine o'clock. So why can't he be a person? In during, between, in daytime, during yeah. in daytime, right? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Your person, yeah, Hi. for sure. Yeah. And um, I learned as well that we should get rid of words like top down or bottom up because um, Why? It, it suggests the top and a, and a bottom. Yeah. But who's on top and who's on the bottom? Yeah. Mm. And that's a bit strange, right? I mean, a civil servant is a civil a servant to society. Yeah. So if if see he or she is a serv servant to society, then. Yeah, the Dutch is overheight, of course, but yeah, it's not okay, in other countries. Yeah, okay, you, you can yeah. say that. Then we yeah. should get rid of that word as well. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, I really liked uh, the three we and the talking, but uh, as, as was stated before, many times we should act and doing, act. and we have lots of tools uh, for doing that, uh, these uh, guys also, and we can uh, learn local governments as well. Uh, okay, so your ambition is actually to to make this, the, the difference between policy makers and uh, city makers uh, or, or, or uh, non-governmental initiatives smaller. Yeah. The difference isn't that big. There should be an equality in the relationship. Yeah. That's your ambition. What's your next step? Yeah, but it's not by uh, uh, making a new system, but no. to get them out of the system yeah. on the ground level. That's, okay. uh, that's my main ambition. And we can start it doing it uh, on Monday and... No, we tonight we're going to dance together. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we can do that yeah. as well. Okay. And that's the, start, the starting point, yeah. Good. So, so this, is, this is about how short I would like you all to do this. But, uh, uh, and I, of course, love to go into the crowd and to hear from you. But we actually really want to have an Amsterdam placemaking ambition. So let's put the Mentimeter on again. I saw at the bottom, you can see... So do they put the Mentimeter on? you can see how many people actually checked in. So if there's less than 100, I'm not going to continue. So, uh, uh, no, just kidding. But I really want you to go there. So go to menti.com in your browser. There is Wi-Fi here, so you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> you go to menti.com, and then you get, um, uh, you're asked to put in a code. Uh, to enter the system and you're on the same platform. 
uh, and it's 96, 46, 91. And then you enter and you're in, and then you see already the first question in your screen, and that is, what is your placemaking ambition you take away from placemaking week? Um, and uh, I can see in the uh, done whether anybody has entered the system. And start answering, please, if you would like to. I know it's really, and do it in, it's okay if it's in keywords. It doesn't need to be perfect, perfect English. It's fine if it's Good. not. Okay. Yeah, this is perfect. Use placemaking to influence inclusiv inclusivity. Can who, who, who put that down? Who put that down? Great, thank you. You're the first. Give her an applause. <laughs> One, two, three. Very good. Can uh, I add something to that? Yeah. Because you don't do it by using smartphones only. Because yeah. lots of people in the You're community right. don't even have a smartphone I or they know. use it for watching okay. YouTube. Do you want me yeah. to check the, digi <laughs> the digital skills of this audience? No. no, no sir. You're right, uh, of course. Um, so, so now I'm going to just ask if we see something very interesting. Look, you, help me, please, panel. If you see something very interesting or you want to reflect on it, please do so. Um, everything is possible to let go of control. Very good. I love this. I don't know. Oh, yeah, the whimsical hats. That's a comment for you. <laughs> uh, global movement. What's defense? You know, taking the fence, and that's, that's poetically. Yeah. Can I also, um, yeah, take, yeah. A, take oh, yeah. a mic, yeah. So, um, yeah. so there's uh, loads and loads of people speaking to each other more and more in, uh, in, in the virtual world, in Facebook, etc. cetera. And um, I, so as many of us noticed is that you, uh, you get the same uh, opinion uh, uh, back uh, to your, your, you. You create these sort of bubbles. Yes. And, and uh, placemaking is... Uh, really, well, yeah, that, but that's really a task that is that, that lies behind placemaking for me at least, like, yeah, because this is turning into a bigger and bigger thing. Like, people are are more engaged in in, in their phones and in their uh, uh, in their virtual world, and uh, and 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 have more time, spend more time also talking on in in, in vir on, on virtual screens than they do in the actual physical space. Yeah, but that is also something like. The physical space, everybody goes there. So that is something that is extremely valuable. And that's a story that also goes to yeah. getting so your, your project bigger and better, yeah. and et cetera. Very good. Defensing also in getting, at your, getting everybody out of their bubbles. So already 35 people are, are partic participating in this online growing ambition for you. Meanskip. Oh, that's somebody from the north of the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, that means um, community in, uh, in, in our second language in the Netherlands, Fries. Yes. <laughs> it's our second language, oh, really. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I just help. Uh, uh, who, who did that? Who did the mean skip? Who's from Leeuwarden here? Hi. Okay. That's always nice. <coughs> yeah. Because it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I like the Leeward um, experience. Please stand up. <laughs> Explain what you mean, meant with that sentence. Uh, we were at the, um, some workshop, and we used Minskip to, to keep hope and to create public space <laughs> and community. Uh, so I got really deep into that. My, my, Minskip got really into me, wow. and, and I think that we should uh, use this to create more public spaces, yeah. and not only create them just because we need to, not, uh, as they were saying, not, 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 not just because it's our function, yeah. but because we are humans and we are trying to do and to give something else to our city. Perfect. Where are you from? Mexico City. So somebody from yeah. Mexico uses a free and lab. Fantastic. Yeah, give him a one, two, three. <laughs> Interesting. From somebody from Mexico City and using it, yeah. It's related really to community and commons, cooperation, collaboration. Uh, good. Is there something else? You, I, I, I was, when I was walking there, did yeah, you see I, something? I, I saw something. It's, it's yeah, it's already up, there, uh, already, yeah. But um, uh, it, the, it was in a discussion just before. Uh, should you do it on a small scale or, or big scale? Yeah. Do it both. Yeah. But um, like in another park, uh, one of my community projects, we 
we stay on a small scale. We have like uh, nine organizations who are partners in this initiative. So you can yeah. do it on a small scale. And they all have their own networks within the neighborhood. And then you connect them together and you get a large, larger scale. And you can tell the story to uh, the city and so on and connect to the city. So but th that small scale is important. But you can connect uh, these networks, these dots together. Nice. And that, therefore you need to connect us, the people like... I think a lot of uh, these guys are here in, the, in this room, uh, the connectors who can make this connection and speak different languages and the language as well as the language of the government as of the, from the ground floor of the people within a park, for instance. Interesting. Who, who, who has formulated the ambition that he or she wants to more, use more seasonal sensitive design? Ah. Mm -hmm. ah. Can you explain a little bit? Uh, well, I went to a workshop yesterday about this. So it was very exciting. Um, I think it is about recognizing that uh, spaces and places change uh, throughout the year, uh, that we need to think about seasons. Um, or uh, I guess, uh, and this morning, somebody was saying about uh, also uh, making metrics potentially a fit uh, a country setting, as in maybe in the Netherlands, uh, a metric for the success of a place is to increase the number of pe people sitting in the sunshine, as in, so the, you would measure that, whereas in, uh, I think it was Singapore or Guadalupe, yeah. they, they were like, no, 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 just you know, like, yeah. get out. So it's offer offering shade. So yeah. it's using similar metrics, but recognizing seasonality and context. So Yeah, uh, acknowledging that we are also part of nature, actually, yes. Good, interesting. Um, this is, this is all, we like this, of course. This is quantity, right? I mean, everybody who's in the team now has a bundle of ambition statements now, and we can send that back to you and say, okay, guys, this is what you collectively are, um, uh, have the ambition to achieve the coming years in placemaking, and you'll get that. But of course, this is the, the closing session, so if we, we would only be in silence looking at our screen, putting answers into a phone, that would be a bit strange for a placemaking week closing, right? So uh, before I'm gonna ask to post the second question on, which is about the next step, I would like some of you to, to give some of you the floor to share some of your insights of these weeks. Who would like to have the floor from the audience? Yeah, and what would you like to share? Uh, I would like to say thank you to every person in this room because it was so exciting to ha have you all here. And I think the main thing here was that we've seen the same cityscape, but we've got so many uh, visions on it that we almost didn't lose any single detail because everyone has his own optics. And it was really nice uh, to, to have that. And uh, I have an idea to do a I was a pity that I didn't have a GoPro camera with me because we're starting a video blog about, uh, about placemaking in Russia. So I would like everyone to share your little videos with me. So we are going to make, a, I'm going to share it with everyone online and I want to make a movie. How can they find you? Uh, well, I think uh, we're going to arrange that on the party. Okay. Okay. So look at this guy. He has a grey uh, thing on, and it, yeah, very good. Look at uh, approach him at the party if you have some video material you want to share with him. I don't know if this is the most efficient, but it's the most fun way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, very good. Thank you. Who, who else would like to say something? Yeah. Um, so I just want to amplify something that some South African um, uh, peers were just telling me, and I, I kind of heard it indirectly uh, from some other folks. So in the prior panel, there's a lot of passion about the sort of urban crisis that we're in. So if we are really in a crisis, should we be doing things differently next year, where maybe there's a bit more action-oriented work sessions, activities, uh, putting together, because we're all here from all over the world, right? We've traveled from all these different distances. It's a very unique moment. And what can we do in person that we can't really do over email or yeah. other means? What so, you, what you see yeah, or, or we can watch a video on YouTube of a presentation. So I think there's a, there's a challenge from some of the folks of how can we better make use of this time given, or maybe it's not a crisis and everything's fine. 
<laughs> yeah. So, well, thanks. Yes. Uh, this was an amazing experience, and the greatest privilege I had was working with many of you from all over the world, and maybe a model that I think other organizations like ULI uses is for us to do TAPS. So people who, who've come to this or who are on the leadership council to be invited to different places to do technical assistance, whether it's the place game or something else, together and to continue working together. Yes. Yeah. Look each other up, right? I mean, use the technical experience of everybody and, and the knowledge to, to further your own ideas and projects. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to go to the second question now, and that is uh, to co-create together for the Amsterdam Placemaking Ambition the next step. So we have like 70 next steps um, to actually uh, 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 start doing uh, things differently if we really want to have inclusive, sustainable societies, public spaces where everybody can thrive and ha live, live healthy and happy lives. Uh, so let's do that. What is your next step on the short term? So actually Monday, or if you have, well, or next Monday, I don't know, the coming weeks. Um, and what you will take in your placemaking practice. Okay, so somebody says invite the mobile, mobile baker. Who's, who said that? Second, organize the first place game in Berlin together with local civil servants, create a local group with creative, crazy people that want to make their city ne nicer, more vivid. Judy's expedition, leaving places at the 4-bit gallery. Think about people. Oh, everybody, you have to go to the newest sites tomorrow because the placemaking week is not over yet. Okay, so join me if you see something. Invite politicians to be part of placemaking actions all year round. Invite press, because then you can make sure politicians show up. Yeah. <laughs> Read the book, The City at the Eye Level. Explore the connection with wayfinding. Yeah, the writer of that book, actually, yeah, put that down. Ty typing that. <laughs> ask the mayor and the council of the city to ask the 95 um, centimeter question, looking the eye at the uh, from the city uh, from a perspective of a three-year-old. Okay, uh, I'm going to do the same thing now. So thank you for co-creating this. Continue doing that. But uh, who would like to say something and look into the eyes? Use the fact that you're in the same room to say something about the next step they want to take. Yeah. I wrote uh, Bring by Root Roni Jal's experience with placemaking for peacemaking to so many other cities. Because uh, Roni uh, should have been here, but he couldn't get through the visa procedure. Um, so he's still in Beirut. But we did the session uh, about placemaking for peacemaking, and Roni works with PPS on this idea. We went with him to Tripoli in Lebanon, and uh, they were shooting at each other in uh, uh, adjacent neighborhoods three years ago, and they, they stopped shooting at each other, and now they uh, co-created a, a football field for their kids to play there. Isn't that fantastic? And, and now I think we need to bring this idea to so many other cities, even in the Netherlands, uh, where people don't, uh, are, are separated more and more. Uh, so to use this idea of placemaking for peacemaking, uh, we should introduce that to a lot of cities. And I would say let's bring Roni over and, and have his expertise and, and maybe he can teach us something. Thanks. Some, some of the, the persons who, who just came in and were like, why are they clapping so strange? Because I asked them to. Uh, uh, I, 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 I was taught by African farmers. Um, so um, thank you for, for doing that with me as an experiment. Um, would you want, like to comment something on the steps you see on the screen? Well, yes, I would like to have a question. It would be nice because everybody's urging for some kind of a platform to share your, because now everybody's here and how can you bring this yeah. together as a learning platform? You know, is it not something uh, for the organization to think about some kind of a digital platform where you can put up your question, question share your... Is it an ongoing thing? Is it already there, Hans? Or can you make it happen? Can Stop anybody? <laughs> Are you the person to answer it? 
question. I don't know if I'm the person to answer it. No, but one of the th the outcomes we'd like to come. Uh, one of the things we'd like to come out of this is a European placemaking network, uh, because I think mostly having these sessions, meeting each other, networking with each other, and then learning from each other. That's the the, the most important thing to do. Uh, we. We'll try to continue working on the city at eye level and, and produce new books through all the stories that we get from you guys. We, we, we are not writing it. It's only a platform for uh, sharing stories open source. So, so many people, uh, so many times people came to us and said, yeah, but you didn't write about this. And for us, this is always the start of a, a talk about a new chapter, right? So, so, uh, so we hope we, get, we will get more, many more stories. Um, so I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Um, well, if somebody was telling that Gail put up a, a website where they share their experience and everything. So, yeah. you know, the next thing would be that this placemaking week ends up with yeah. something that shares all the, you know, content. Well, who, who wants to say something now? To answer <laughs> this? Yeah? Please. Uh, uh, last night, I think it was the fireside chat, someone brought up, uh, creating some way for everyone to stay connected, whether it's a lift serve or something like that. So I think it tees off directly on what you're asking for. I don't know who manage it, who organize it, but some way for us to stay connected and, and to support each other uh, as a service. Yeah, but Telegram of WhatsApp or WhatsApp or, or some other non-commercial, yeah, uh, open source thing. Open yeah. Source. Good. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, somebody has to organize it. Who's going to organize it? I, I always like numbers and names. Oh, the Russian person. The guy is also asking all your video thing. Very good. <laughs> What's your name? It's Philip. Hi, Philip. Sorry, you have two tasks now. Uh, good. Um, yeah, that's good to get, get connected and get... get every, I like Carlota. Where's Carlota? Who is by Twitter saying that she wonders whether placemaking is possible without revolution? Oh, she's she's revolutionizing uh. drinking beer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's it's time to sum up. Um, what what we what are take main takeaways from this conference? Do you want to? I'm just gonna say. If you do, you want to add something? Now, I would just like to thank everybody for being here, for helping our city to do um, what's best for our city <coughs> and um, end with the words, let's reach out and start doing it and stop making, stop thinking in complexity, but start doing. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I really like the uh, placemaking to peacemaking and I think that the sort of challenge is also to go from a multicultural society to a more a transcultural society where you use each other's backgrounds to make new places yeah. and these the creation of these places that there's so much energy and so much love also uh, put into these kind of things and and seeing that in the city in, in large scale that is that is I think one of the most important efforts that we have to take in Thank yeah you. Yes, I was also triggered a lot by the questions on inclusivity and I, once more, it's really, yeah, noticed the importance of that and I think that we, for all those <coughs> pla local placemaking projects who really connect people, uh, we need also bigger context, so we need, you cannot do a neighborhood campsite for all kinds of different people when um, uh, bigger uh, neighborhoods are, are segregated and not integrated and not, not mixed, so... Uh, we know it needs to be on all levels of city planning. Yeah, so we cannot do, start doing all the time and do local placemaking when on a higher level of policy making it's not uh, being, yes. Good, very important, I think, uh, uh, thing to stipulate. You cannot, otherwise it will just be small initiatives and it will never change the fabric of the city in total. Yeah. I think we should celebrate uh, complexity complexity and we <laughs> should celebrate uncertainty as well as uh, doing risky things and uh, uh, do it from a ground level and get rid of uh, as many structures, structures and systems as possible. Okay. Start improvising and do it. Yeah. <laughs> For the entire panel, one, two, three. Yeah, it really works if, if a lot of people are doing it. Um, Eva, you were late, but join me on stage.
for a second, because you were also on the panel. Um, famous last words, you, 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 you held the key words, you, you, you held the key notes uh, in Lely. Um, many people went, uh, Broedplaats Lely, you went to, uh, uh, you went, uh, uh, many people went to sites in Amsterdam, visited sites in Amsterdam that you were one of the contributors to. Um, did you like the place making week? Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's always nice to meet lots of people from other countries and insights. Yes. Yeah. What was the most important insight you took away from the week? Well, I noticed that there's placemaking has different meanings in different countries, so that was quite nice to learn that it has a different uh, feeling in other countries than here. I'm feeling quite offended being a placemaker, you know, being used as a tool for gentrification, but I noticed that there's other means to it as well. That was very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, one, two, three. Good. Um, yeah, well, it's, 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 it, it, we, will, we will get into it uh, finally, don't worry. Okay, thank you for co-creating this uh, Amsterdam placemaking uh, ambition. I think you will, you will all get a copy probably. It will be on the site or it will be emailed to you. You can see what other people actually are going to do next step or what their ambitions are for the coming years. Um, some logistical information. That's part of a conference. Um, that you, do you, if you still have a voucher, you haven't collected it yet, for the City at Eye Level book, um, it's in your badge and you can get the book on the ground floor here. Tomorrow, at the last day of the conference, it's not over yet, um, uh, the Pakhuis de Zwijger, this venue is closed. Uh, and for all tours, uh, you can, uh, uh, the meeting places are uh, uh, found in the online schedule. Except, yeah, for the boat ride. And Peter Groenendaal is here. Yes, join me on stage. Yeah, very good. Please, what do you want to say about the boat ride? The love boat. The love boat. <laughs> it's all, the, pa yeah. the passion, but short, but yes. short. The love and the passion that we all have for the city will take us through tough times. And it will actually, as long as there's love and passion, between Russia and America. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, really, we really need to move forward with a lot of love and passion. Good. We, stop. What is the boat ride time? <laughs> <laughs> well, the boat time actually is the same. It's quarter to nine. And we're actually leaving from a different place. Okay. And it is? Hanukkah's bomb. You can find on the on the schedule or... Hanukkah's boom. Hanukkah's <laughs> boom. 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 Yeah. boom. Thank you. So the place is different. Thank you so much. Yeah, you will see tomorrow, Peter Groenendaal. If you take the love boat at 8.45, it's going to be at Hanukkah's boom. It's nearby this place uh, at the water site. Um, then the last uh, uh, thing to say to you is tonight there is an after party. Um, and it's at Amsterdam Roost. And um, it's a, very good, it's a starting at nine o'clock onwards. Oh, okay. After uh, tomorrow, after the boat ride, I understand there's another after, after party, yeah, which is a Dutch custom. Yes. And it's the, uh, it's also at Hanukkah's Boom, and I think it starts at nine o'clock. Okay, so for the after, after party tomorrow, you go to Hanukkah's Boom. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to close this session formally by saying thank you to the panel, but also to you for co-creating this ambition. One, two, three. Thank you. <laughs>